Hello there, welcome back. Today I'm talking about Z Channel Magnificent Obsession, which is a film by Zan Casavetes, all about the Z Channel and its programmer Jerry Harvey, who uh, who in the late 80s killed his uh, wife and then shot himself an hour later. But before that, for almost a decade, he was running Z Channel, which was this programming, kind of culture programming channel that showed a lot of films, a lot of them uncut, to people in Los, Va- Los Angeles, and it made a massive influence on people, because everybody in the industry had Z Channel, because it was showing films that couldn't be seen anywhere else, it was really a film buffs channel, it was one of those ones, things that influenced a lot of people, and this film was into how it was set up, why it was so important, and what was the kind of um, interpersonal things that were going behind the scenes that no one would mm-hmm. know about. So it's both, both a good and a bad of Z Channel, really. So it's quite a balanced documentary. It's not a great documentary, but it's a good one. It's one of those ones like, this is basically what I do with what you've got in this information. Because a lot of it's dealing with like um, talking heads of people who remember Z Channel. This film was released in 2004, whatever that time. So it's people a decade after what happened. But some of the participants were dead, and other people had moved on. So it was. Um, with a lot of people talking about what happened with not much footage of what happened. So it's that kind of documentary. So you just have to accept that's the the limitations that the filmmakers are working with. So that's what it is. But it is well told. You do get the idea of what's going on. So it starts up with telling you what happened with Jerry Harvey. So you have no um Fantasy is going to be happy, going to be a happy ending. Because so I had no idea about Z Channel before I watched that documentary. I had no clue. I'd heard of it vaguely, but it was, it wasn't anything that really interested me really. And it does go into the film. Does start off with the death and the murder, and it does explain who Jerry Harvey was. And it goes back and forward throughout the film. So it does a bit about him, then it goes into the channel, then a bit more about his personal life, then back to the channel. So it goes back and forward and you get built more and more. But this is a very depressed, very intelligent guy who's also dealing with depression, having a, dealing with therapy all the time. And he was like, he, he was a, he had a sister who committed suicide like along the past apparently, it was about mystery. And then his other sister committed suicide like in the 70s. So he was the only survivor of this, these three, ch- three children. And um, there was lots of tales of him actually being unstable and there was a sense of, you know, this is not going to end well because he had some deep psychological problems dealing with his parents, you know, his mother and father. His father was apparently a complete lunatic who was abusive, according to this film, and the mother let it happen. So there was... And there was lots of talk about how they, they all felt they came from bad stock, the uh, children. And there was just like, there was no way this was going to end well. But Harvey, Jerry Harvey was the one who kind of went much further, in a sense of having a career and having passions outside of his family. He was always a film nut, he always escaped into filmmaking. But it wasn't like an escape, like a fantasy thing of being a trick or something. This was like, he was serious about films, he wanted to watch good films about life so it wasn't just films about trying to sort the pain by finding fantasy it was films about what's the reality so he was obsessed by rea- by uh, filmmaking but it was a fil- certain type of filmmaking that looks into why certain people like intelligent films like and I'm one of them it's like well it's it's a release of emotions of things you can't quite Figure it out on your own, in your own life. So in some ways it is a crutch for you. But the well, the mainstream films don't really do much for you because you know they're lying to you. So you're looking for more intelligent stuff. And a lot of the more intelligent stuff apparently, the ones that think they're more intelligent, a lot of the indies really aren't that intelligent. So that's annoying as well. And as you go on you see a lot of directors who you initially thought were great, it turned out to be pretty fake. So there's that kind of tension within a kind of film fan, always. Then you either try and keep it be honest and try and keep on finding more interesting directors, or you can just stick to your 
top people who are the bastions and you stick to that. And this is a guy who is seemed to be much more like turning through influences and trying to be honest with himself and honest with what he's about, but he also had a massive problems that he couldn't deal with. So he's a perfect film fan, but also probably a bit more <laughs> a bit more disturbed than your average film fan. Or at least some of them. I mean, when I saw what he went through, I was like, oh, thank God I'm not him. Because <laughs> it's like, I'm bad enough with a decent upbringing. <laughs> you know. But it, is, it does speak to a certain kind of film fanatic and the obsessive nature. The sense that even intelligent films are there to help you deal with stuff that you're having difficulties with in life and try to appreciate the world or deal with the world and all its problems one step removed but also try to get a sense of reality and how difficult that is and how industries change and that's only like a small period of time that can happen and then it falls away and it comes back and it falls away it's just this thing about filmmaking is it's, it's never always going to be a golden period <laughs> it's always going to be trashed about what period you like and some of your obsession with it is you more than the film industry <laughs> And the needs of a film fan sometimes aren't very realistic and probably are immature in a lot of ways. So there's this film that touches and all that stuff without exploring it. But that's fine because it's not really about exploring that. It's just like that's all there and sur under the surface. There's, there can be darkness there, but filmmaking is also something like films actually helps people out of the darkness because it's like it's an escape from your troubles. So Jerry Harvey started off as a young film student. He, he wrote one film for Monty Hillman, China 37, Liberty 9, or, or I'm not sure I've got that right. But he did that, I remember that time his uh, sister died and uh, put him into depression, or sister committed suicide, put him into depression. And after that film came out and was basically buried, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do with his life. And then he got a job on Z Channel and he soon became the programmer because the other programmer moved on. And so he just programmed the way he wanted to see things. Instead of having a committee, he just programmed what he liked. He had a budget and he could buy films to show the channel. But there was a budget he had to stick to and it was always a source of tension because budgets came and went and up and down. He also had a film magazine that he started, the G Channel magazine, so they could talk about films and so if they were going to do a retrospective or they were going to do a... So there's always a guide to Z Channel, what it's going to show, but also they could talk about the films they're going to make and interview people and make it uh, about the... Obviously explain why these films are going to show and why they're important and uh, education to film culture in America where... Unless you're in the East Coast with film comment, there's not much of. A lot of the film magazines have always been like gossip columns or like industry things that premiere, which are there to promote the big films, who get big interviews with the stars of the big films. They may be a bit critical here or there, but generally they're pretty sycophantic. And this one, you might make, make an odd look towards the... The darker films are the more difficult films, but not much, not very often. It's almost a special little bit in the back of the magazine. Here, everything was about that. Everything was about that culture. You know, they still had to um, have some commerciality. They needed some subscribers, but their way of getting subscribers was we're going to show you stuff that no one else will show you. We're going to show you the interest in films. And even then, they still had to do things like. Um, the After Dark Sex in the Channel for the kind of grown up films, the, the nudie films, <laughs> you know, which were the most popular part of the, sh of the channel, obviously. But it paid for the rest of it. And Harvey would do a lot of really great films. Like, he was a, he was a guy who showed the uncut um, Heaven's Gate. He was the first person to show Heaven's Gate uncut. Before the big re-releases, and now it's Heaven's Gate is evaluated as an interesting film that was unjustly treated. That's, that's, that's he was his, his channel was the first one to do that, 
it was the first channel to show Once Upon a Time in America uncut, the European version. I've never actually seen the American version, the two hour version. I've never seen it because we never got that version over here. Or by the time I was a film fan, the only version you could get was the four hour version. But there is a two hour version somewhere, but I've never seen it. Nor do I really want to see it. And but they were the first one. They actually showed the original, the theatrical American cut and the European cut, so you could see what happened to it. And they would have retrospectives. I mean, Paul Verhoeven says a lot of people saw his early films through Z Channel because they would buy them in and show them. So a lot of people saw who Verhoeven was while he was trying to break into the American industry. So a lot of the executives who were financing films would see these films in Z Channel. It was like, oh, okay. well, some of the more interesting executives. Not the mainstream ones, the ones play at Ryan who are financing Robocop and stuff. They're the ones who are seeing this and going, oh, that guy's interesting, let's get him. You know, there's, there's that thing of the interest directors are getting a boost from Z Channel. There's a tale of Salvador. Salvador came and went in its initial theatrical release, and all the storm was off doing Platoon. Around about Christmas of the, the year of his release, Z Channel showed Salvador, and a lot of the Academy voters who had never seen it suddenly saw it before the Oscar nominations and suddenly this film got Oscar nominations for James Woods and the screenplay and everything else. So all the storm was competing against himself with Platoon and Salvador. Now because the Z Channel was the one that said this film is important, let's show it. So there's lots of th things like that that they, sh that they did. It also just showed you obscure films that were hard to find. And it's kind of doing what movies do in the UK now, where it shows you stuff and you've got, it's limited time to see it, but it's showing you things and you can see unique things. It's not like Netflix, Netflix showing you all the mainstream stuff and you don't really get anything interesting. This is much more like movie or the independent channel or a criterion channel where they'll show you the good stuff. This is where you have a chance to see the good films and see them in good condition and, and find out what they are and find out what... Because a lot of times you um filmmaking, actually just seeing films is difficult. I mean, I have anxiety, so I don't get out much to see films anyway. But also, just seeing them, we've been going up to Glasgow and hoping they're on and just checking for them on because hopefully we'll go to GFT, which may happen, might not. It's now much easier just to see them digitally project them yourself. It is to try and rely on if some film eventually coming. And that's kind of what Z Channel was doing. It was just showing stuff on TV. It was things that they might have played quickly years ago and then never been seen again. But this film channel would show it and be like, okay, this is what they're showing. This is what they're doing. So that's kind of what it was about. That was what the channel was. It was like, you're seeing things you would not normally see and you're seeing them for the subscription. Eventually things went wrong because they were bought over a few times and the last place they were bought over with wanted to do run sports as well as the movies. Which was never going to work for who the places were. They were also dealing with Showtime and uh, HBO who were a competition. But they were much, but they were seemed to be they were doing okay in competition with each other. But they were going to expand the HG channel to other areas, not just LA when the stock market crash happened, so all their capital went and they couldn't do it. And that was kind of the end, because then they went into the sports thing. Harvey, Jerry Harvey killed his wife and himself, and it just kind of fell apart after that. And it moved on, so after that, Sundance started to come up. So there's always something, of one thing collapsed, there's always something else. Sundance then came up, became a big um, avenue for like indie distribution. So it was in the 70s you'd, you'd indie stuff used to do. In the 80s, Z Channel would show and you'd get an odd indie film in low budget. In the 90s, indie became much more popular again. So these things always come and go. It's, there's, there's, a, there's a peak period and they fall away. And that's what I'm going to just about this one, these peak periods. But it was troubling because the guy in charge had some real issues, had really difficulty, real difficulties. And from all accounts, his wife who died was a lovely person, very decent, very helpful to him. It's just that someone with those many problems should never have gone near them. And should have been highly medicated, heavily medicated, and just 
forced to keep doing it because they were dangerous. It was just one of those things, like, in retrospect, no one's learned lessons. People still have mental problems still get guns. You know, you should, no one with depression should have a gun. It's not a good thing. It can lead to tragedy, not just for them, but for other people. It's just obvious, common sense things, but no one ever listens, so... So yes, this looks at the tragedy and the great points of this channel and like the people who are listening to it and just general film watch and general uh, the nature of film obsessive because this was a film obsessive who ran it and who had problems and, and, and he, he knew his audience because he was one of the audience. So it's definitely worth checking out if you can find it. It's a hard documentary to find. But I recommend trying to check the channel of Magnificent Obsession because it is well worth seeing. So I hope you enjoyed this. I'll be back soon with another one. Right, bye.